In today's global economy, quality matters. Benjamin Franklin once quipped, the bitterness of poor quality remains long after the sweetness of low price is forgotten. Quality Matters is here to talk about all things quality. So whether you're looking to improve your business, getting ready for an audit, or dealing with failed inspections, tune in, check us out, then get back to doing work that matters. Well, hello. Welcome back to the Quality Matters podcast. I am Kyle Chambers. And reminder, the Quality Matters podcast is brought to you by Texas Quality Assurance, where quality management gets simplified. So today we are bringing on another guest. We have uh, Aaron Urban here, and we are going to be talking about what is the hot topic of the day, which is a lot of the workplace issues that we have going on. So, Aaron, welcome to the podcast again. I'm excited to be here, Kyle. No, good to have you. Good to have you. So I know we've had you on before, but my gosh, that's been at this point nearly two years or more. <laughs> a lot has changed it's in two years. Yes. <laughs> so give kind of a, a quick rundown. I, I always just per let folks introduce themselves and me try to botch their bio and experience. So just give me a quick rundown of kind of, you know, what it is you do a little bit about the business and and uh, we'll dive into our conversation here. Sure, Kyle. Well, what I do is I partner with leaders and teams to elevate their impact so they can achieve peak performance and increase income influence. Well, so that is that's really important. Yeah, I think that's something. That... For. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But no, that's that's why I want to have you on is because I think this is going to be a topic that uh, you'll really be able to uh, to help speak to and help folks understand. I mean, I think everyone has a general idea that the workplace is kind of goofy, but beyond problems, hiring and keeping retention. And we all hear the, the buzzwords thrown around like the, uh, the great resignation and gig economy, but let's be honest, this means nothing without context. So I, I guess I'll, I'll kind of start and then they can get your two cents on it is we did a survey through the uh, big Alliance and mm -hmm. OGGN. And what we were trying to do is try to understand where businesses are seeing the biggest issues when it comes to contingency planning. Now, historically, especially Gulf Mexico, hurricanes, always a big issue. After the freeze we had a couple of years, we expected a lot there. Of course, cybersecurity has been a creeping issue for the past few years. But all of those combined did not equal the concern that folks have over workforce instability, which... I guess shouldn't have blown my mind, but absolutely did because every single one of our clients talks about problems they have finding and retaining good talent. So that's kind of my intro to the topic. So, you, you know, what uh, what's kind of your take on this craziness going out here? Well, it should come as no big surprise that it's not necessarily one issue. I mean, wouldn't it be great if I could just say what it's just this and exactly stop, and that's it we walk away we're yes. done and, you know just solve that you're good uh two thumbs up keep rolling right, Hashtag right. future of work <laughs> yeah well i think we'd have a career in politics if we could do that yeah yeah absolutely. <laughs> why not we solve yeah. all world issues <laughs> there right it. done uh, yeah it done so it's really interesting you bring up the great resignation and i think in order for leaders and owners to understand how to actually tackle this and show up in this space mm -hmm. a little history probably wouldn't go amiss so let's yeah, understand context is always key yeah understanding well, you know prior data maybe maybe calls analysis so let's take yeah. a look at that yeah <laughs> let's take a look at what what happened what set the stage mm -hmm. right i mean didn't suddenly 2021 everybody's like eh whatever yeah <laughs> We'll just quit eh, take this job and you know what uh, yeah. that, that... <laughs> but that's happening so it why is. is that happening well 2020 i don't know if anybody noticed but we had this thing called a pandemic <laughs> and <laughs> it made things a little 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 sticky just so a little <laughs> just a little bit but it was it was the first time a lot mm -hmm. of people had in their entire lives to pause they had the pause. I call it the pandemic pause or 2020. Uh, it's also called the great Resi reflection. You know, the great resignation. We mm -hmm. had a great reflection in 2020. So what happened was they woke up, they looked around, they said, I really don't 
like what I'm doing. I don't like the management. I don't like the culture. It just, just, just didn't work for them. Yeah. Right. There's a whole lot of things that we were putting up with. Let's just be honest, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> we put up with a lot. And because yeah. why? Well, we were afraid to, for our jobs. Yeah. Right. So we put up with a lot up to this point because of fear. Right. It's a big driver. Well, not necessarily we've driver. run into that here. You know, we've, um, you know, when we were looking to uh, find a new employee here, maybe six months or so ago. And the problem we ran into is what we called uh, golden handcuffs. And, you know, it was kind of my issue when I, I quit my job to start the business here is you got a good paying job. You've got the security and you're just shackled and chained to it. Um, so I in any case, I completely, completely get where you're uh, where you're coming from there. But go ahead. Sorry. All right. No, no, because I, I can please interrupt me because I'll just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> as, we, as we spoke before the show, I'm pretty passionate about this topic. Yep. It's so fascinating what's going on right now. So I'll jump ahead a little bit and then I'll come back to sure. give you a taste of what is what we're experiencing at this moment mm -hmm. in our human evolution mm -hmm. is we're on the threshold of an entirely new era. Mm -hmm. It's an exciting and challenging time. So what's leading up to this? What's 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 going on with this great reset? So we're really what right. we're seeing overall is a great reset, a reset yeah. of how people want to behave, be treated, show up in the workplace, how they want to work full stop. So all of that is being re realigned. Right. We're not quite sure what will come out of this. I yeah. call it the, hat, the never normal is what we're in right now. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I'm going to have to use that. <laughs> yes. Feel free. Please do. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, and the new normal. No, this, there's no normal yet. We're in a strong change cycle. Yeah. We're not quite out of that yet. Right. Whenever we're offering a new era, like mm -hmm. in the 1920s, for example, World mm -hmm. Wars, a lot of change, we're going through something similar. Yeah. Uh, different complexities, different players, different paradigms. We have technology. Excellent. There's a whole lot of influencers here. So it's not just the one and done. Oh, it's people want to work right. remotely. It's more to that. It's more than that, to be fair. So you did a survey. I did a survey because I wanted to find out. All right. <laughs> what is driving? I know. Data nerd. Lean six and my black right, belt. Right. I can't help it. You know, I'm going to go out there and make a data. <laughs> so I went out there and I did a data. Uh, did, I did a survey. And what I have <clears throat> here, <laughs> you say, check the paper, make it sound official. Right. right. What do they do on um, the, the old, uh, they don't tap the papers in front of them. To make oh, yeah. It look really funny. Yeah. That, yep. That's what I'm doing here. Just imagine them doing the tapping the paper thing. So my research was, okay, first of all, what is driving this great resignation? Why, right. why are people leaving? Well, 219 people said toxic work reply to the survey and 47 percent of those said toxic work cultures okay i wouldn't We're disagree with that in, in in large part now don't get me wrong i love the company i was working at before and i mm -hmm. think it is one of the better examples of what was out there but it was still the case like a 60 hour week means that you're lazy and that's just that shouldn't be normal <laughs> it's not so Let's put a bookmark in that because I want to put a pin in that. It's that's okay. very, very important example of the paradigm shift we're experiencing. Mm -hmm. We put up with a lot of crap. You can say it. Say oh, yeah. on your podcast. I don't, I don't know. Think, <laughs> I don't think we'll we're not monetized on YouTube, so go ahead and say it. <laughs> okay, okay. So we, we did. We put up yeah. a lot of things that yep. we that aren't healthy mm -hmm. beneficial don't do not fuel people peak productivity i mean just i could give you it can oh yeah self-care out the window what's that self-care yeah. you have the nerve to do, talk about self-care i mean that was the old paradigm yeah that's shifting so yes toxic work culture 47 percent of 219 people so i ask okay great so what's driving that yeah right 175 people responded to that and they said 58 percent poor leadership wouldn't disagree either, especially when you Followed look at the amount of emphasis that's put on, you know, mm -hmm. leadership development. It's it's honestly uh, well, thrown out the window for the past yeah. yeah 
Yeah. And what, what there is there is is such high level fluff that no, no one can grasp their head around it. I mean, when I start, when I mentor any uh, new uh, quality managers, mm -hmm. the first thing I tell them is that you need to do your own little mini version of dirty jobs. Like get your butt out there, put a hard hat on, put the gloves yeah. on, forget mm -hmm. your job for the day. You're a weld helper today. You're okay. out in the wash pit today. Just go do the dang job. And mm -hmm. in any case, just it's, it's, you don't find that any sort of leadership training for the most part today. Right. And beyond that, even for those people who've been through that, like, so mm -hmm. let's just say that's where they came from. What has happened, not on all cases, but quite mm -hmm. a few cases, X person, been at the company so many years, yep. could have not a leadership bone in his or her body. No. But they were there. <laughs> and because they've been there for a while, guess what? They, they get, get promoted. promoted. So what yeah. happens? They lose a great individual contributor and gain mm -hmm. a really bad manager. Good for you. <laughs> well, nobody does. Nobody has done historically really any investigation and understanding. Okay, what are the key characteristics mm -hmm. and traits of good leadership? Yep. And and by the way, anybody can be a good leader. Just know that some personality styles and work styles are work better more amenable for that than others and others needs a little bit more <laughs> awakening and awareness and self-work because i think yeah. that was me i uh you know spent a lot of time talking with uh darcy recently like my gosh if i had known you know when i started the business like i was very i very very good and competent at my job very very good very very competent at my job that accounts for maybe 15 to 20 percent of the skills i need today running a very small business where i'm still intimately involved that's only 15 20 percent of the skills that's necessary i had to learn the rest of it the hard way <laughs> yeah, yeah. i had to learn the hard way too because yeah. i was i was convinced <laughs> that leadership meant you were super professional right and you did spend time in small talk and you got things done and you you know you bottom line what's next driven right uh, yeah, yeah. I was real, you know what to deal with so, <laughs> and surprise to nobody i did not really get that leadership role that i was expecting <laughs> until i learned to appreciate people so here's the deal brass tacks leadership equals people skills mm -hmm. yeah i you, agree you get over the need for being to be an expert mm -hmm. in the thing and learn how to deal with people or don't bother like don't go there because You're it's just going to be miserable for everybody no totally agree you're, you're talking to a hardcore introvert computer geek right here had to learn a very hard way <laughs> yeah so did i I, yeah. I mean i had to get a, a big slap in the face and oh by the way your team doesn't like you i was like oh yeah what <laughs> what did i do wrong i thought i was super professional yeah that's what you did wrong congratulations <laughs> but we we live by that that's the old paradigm that's the old way yep. of thinking so it's very interesting um now the followed up by the 58 percent of leadership the another 25 percent. so that was number two sure uh, said burnout yeah yeah yep. um they were they're like you know I'm, I'm out of here because i'm toxic work environment i'm burned out as you mentioned mm -hmm. the 60 hours a week was considered lazy that's yeah. not sustainable. No. So what we're seeing is a reinvention of the workplace. Now, yep. some companies are getting on board and they're like, oh, OK, well, let's understand, you know, particularly with the up and coming generations. What are their expectations? Will they need to thrive, et cetera? Now, know that the up and coming generations have been labeled as lazy. Right. OK, so Gen Xers and baby boomers. I'm a Gen Xer. Nobody right. talks about us. We're like, who cares? Gen <laughs> yeah, you don't exist. <laughs> Yeah, whatever. You know, okay, Gen Xers and baby boomers. Um, you're just jealous. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't, you didn't think about this before now. Right. Um, self care, well being, what? That's yeah. for that's well, for and a lot of the the yeah. dynamics are just our I mean, culture outside of work has changed over mm -hmm. the past few decades as well. I mean, we don't have the tight knit social structures that we did even when I was a kid. And I'm what they call an elder millennial, and even as a kid my social structure was my neighborhood and i'd ride my bike three or four miles to see all my friends in one day and that just doesn't happen much today and so much. what we used to get in our you know uh you know home and social and church and whatever other organizational structures that we had outside of work those are all kind of weird and fragmented now mm -hmm. and i mean it makes sense that our work um the way we operate and interact and work has to change as well. 
Yeah. And it we've does. got basic needs regardless where they're fulfilled. That's right. Right. We do have basic human needs and there's a few basic laws of how humans work best together. And yep. oh, top down hierarchical leadership is not one of them. <laughs> it isn't. So moving nope. forward, I mean, collaborative leadership always has been a has fueled better results. It's very interesting. Just this past weekend, birthday party out of the blue. Don't know this guy from Adam. Turns out he's a former top GE executive. Mm hmm was like ranked number three out of the world as far mm -hmm. as his team performance and leadership he burned out oh yeah mm -hmm. um so now he's not doing that anymore <laughs> however and to be fair he's you know retired and all that good stuff too but he said you know what he goes i believe in servant leadership because they wanted they wanted to come in okay you know mm -hmm. gee okay that's working how can we emulate this and they they couldn't wrap their heads around mm -hmm. servant leadership he says you know it's about the, the people that work for me not about how awesome i am he didn't yeah. even have a college degree yeah yeah and, and that you know well that's a whole other fun topic that we could go <laughs> into there I, I gotta i gotta stop myself but um yeah. you know there's there's been so much emphasis on and i think this kind of feeds into what you're saying on these formal structures and very formal mm -hmm. methods and mm -hmm. but you can't just rip the rug out from under that structure either say well right. no we're going to go with everything informal the education and none of that matters the the way in which we communicate no longer matters the way we dress mm -hmm. no longer. you can't just rip the rug out and have another organizational system step in its place right right you're absolutely right so how do we how do we shift how do we shift yeah. the paradigm in a healthy way yeah um well first is understanding the people like, yeah what are the people asking for and typically with um i don't know what to say this is true for everybody but what we're hearing more strongly out of those people who identify with gen y and gen z uh, generations is they want to be invested in mm -hmm. you know that talent development that thing that we haven't spent any money on for the past 15 years yeah that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's one of the major reasons so it's very interesting side note and i'll mm -hmm. come back to this uh, I've been doing some conversations with the likes of uh, Dewar Institute, Rice University, et cetera. Like what, what went wrong? Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. Poor leadership. What went wrong? Well, economic up and down swings and roundabouts. The first thing to go has been T and D training and development. And when training development goes out the window and you're not investing in your people, you're not investing in your leaders, yep. even with, half butt programs it was something right right if you're not doing this then how are you supposed to develop your leaders you can't so we're really pushing coaching executive level coaching for mid-level and entry-level managers mm -hmm. because it's it's really important this this is the level yeah okay executives great that's important too and mm -hmm. the the people who are the closest to your customer is where mm -hmm. you need to spend most of your energy. And we're not it is. That. Well, I was having a, a fun conversation with someone uh, just a few days ago. They're, um, you know, you've probably seen stuff like you've got like these new hard hats that have like, you know, built in heads up display and, mm. you know, all this different type of stuff. So he's trying to talk like, well, how do we get this integrated? And there's some, tons of cool stuff in it, like, it, you know, tracking your heart rate, your pulse, tracking, you know, the angle you're standing and try to monitor fatigue and all this. And they're, they're coming at me with all these fun bells and whistles about what it can do. I'm sitting here scratching my head and he's like, so what do you think? You think, you know, how could I get people to adopt this? And I said, you just gave me all of the points for the top level executive who never sees the person on the floor, why they would adopt it. He's like, well, fine. How do you get the guy on the floor to adopt it? I said, there's only two ways you're going to get the guy on the floor to adopt it. Anyway, I'm talking about someone that's like, you know, a, a welder, a mechanic, whatever. So I said, one, you got to prove that it's going to decrease their daily stress load. So if it means that they're not going to get reamed every time they have to put a project on pause to wait for their stupor to give them some advice, they're going to buy in. And two, if you can increase your physical comfort. And he was showing me one device. And I'm like, dude, I wouldn't want to wear that if I'm out on the shop floor all day. Man, that's going to be in my way. I'm Ain't no way I'm wearing that. Uh, yeah. And it's just like, but people so often skip over that. So, I mean, I'm just glad to hear you say that because it is. It is that middle management point that so often gets glossed over. They are the interaction between the end user, the, whether the end user is your internal employee for some program you're selling or your legitimate customer that's out there. That person is the point in contact. They've got to be able to translate between the executive jargon 
to the average Joe. And that's tough. Right. That right. is right. that is a tough skill and it can't be taught in university. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we are talking about, um, let's just say the 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 poignancy of influence and impact is very different at the executive level. And mm -hmm. by the way, we have a train. <laughs> and, um, they're passing through just just for this podcast, by the way. Right, I, right, right. Just for this podcast, <laughs> not for any other podcast. This is one. So it will be emphasizing my points. But yes, when it comes to the poignancy of the influence that you're seeing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and where it resonates on the value chain and where it resonates yeah. particularly with your customer and how it influences income is very yep. different at the executive level mm -hmm. than at the frontline leadership yep. and management level. Um, the frontline leadership and management level is where your impact to the customer has the most influence. It is. Right? Yeah. So if that's where you want to see a change, that's where you mm -hmm. need to put your energy. Now, at the executive level, we're talking about shareholders, we're talking about Wall Street, <laughs> we're talking about, you know. Yeah. Yeah, train. Right. We're talking about <laughs> There's some things that I just can't control, that's one of them. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> So, you know, that's it's a different type of influence. It is. So it really depends on where you want to see your emphasis and your difference in, as far as your money and your margins and your income. So right. how do you reach those mid-level frontline uh, leadership positions? I mean, how do you educate them? Because obviously it is a completely different skill set that I think just right. so much gets glossed over. And it's also a skill set that I think may have been more readily available mm -hmm. 20, 30 years ago than it is today. You know, I was raised on a computer, right? My social interaction was sneaking out in the house for a LAN party in high school, right? Not exactly learning great people skills. So how do you teach this to, to the folks coming up in these positions? Good, good. Good point. So what I'm finding with the executives that I'm coaching is they're like, what is going on? It's like, you now need to teach these younger folks coming in how to people. You need to teach people, <laughs> need to teach people how to people because yeah. they haven't received that education. Mm -hmm. They no. just have it. And yeah. to be fair, neither did our generation. I mean, when I started learning more about, you know, what they call soft skills, which has hard consequences, you know, basically behavioral science type a knowledge and having mm -hmm. that and understanding that it's like why don't they teach us in high school it would solve a lot of the world's problems to be honest i they agree don't and that's not the competencies that for whatever reason our federal government want to see yeah. i don't know but there you go so now leaders and organizations are tasked with needing to teach their people how to people yeah so that's number one um, then understanding, okay, how can I invest in these people other than teaching them how to people? Like, what do they want? How do they want to grow? Yeah. Because that's that's the number one I want to be invested in. Mm -hmm. Then, they, of course, they want some flexibility. Mm -hmm. They don't want to hear, oh, you only work 60 hours this week? What's wrong with you? <laughs> that's that's yeah. not what they want to hear. They, <clears throat> nope. they definitely want the work-life balance. Yeah. And that's, a, that's another one of these fun little uh, kind of buzz terms that gets thrown in a while that folks don't really have a good understanding of. And, and I would you know, very easily say <clears throat> that there truly is no right answer, but mm. okay. So here's something we do. I'm kind of curious what your, your two cents is on this. Um, so we have a philosophy we call 95 five. And so what that means is while you're on the clock, you've got certain designated work hours. Again, this changes with some jobs that, you know, don't have such set work hours, but we work with small business. So we've got a good, you know, kind of eight to five is when you need to be available. Mm -hmm. So what we say is when you're on the clock, I expect 95% of your effort is dedicated to the business, but I get it. Your kid's going to get sick. You're going to have some late bill that you've got to call in, you know, yell at the phone company for like, you got crap that comes up. Life happens. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, when you're off the clock, we also know that sometimes there's that emergency situation that has to happen. And I may need to give you a phone call at seven o'clock at night or send you a team message or something. And I might need a quick response to it but we both have to respect each other in that space and so that's what we kind of talk about the 95 5 relationship it's why right. you're here take care of your family take care of your work you know take care of your home but same time we need a little bit of flexibility both ways um kind of curious what your thoughts are on that right and some people would say there is no such thing as work-life balance because the two are so blended particularly for those folks who are working remotely and and they have a point there they do 
However, <laughs> it's all about setting expectations. So you set very clear expectations, which what the what the behavior is expected. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's when the, those clear expectations aren't set is when yeah. the dissonance happens. Because, you know, I hear it all the time. Oh, yeah, they told me X when they interviewed me. Now it's Y. Yeah. <laughs> Stop lying to your people. Uh, you know, that's, that's that a simple one it. there. <laughs> no, <we're not>. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, don't get me on that soapbox. But, <laughs> you know, setting clear expectations. Sure. You know, what is work-life balance? Well, here's a concept. Now, this is maybe a little bit of a stretch for some Instead of focusing on when and where people work, mm -hmm. it's largely immaterial unless it's you know shackled to your job, of course. Yeah. Instead of focusing on the details, yeah. Set the expectation. All right. When is X due? Well, let's just say it's a report or it's a deadline mm -hmm. or, it's a, or, mm -hmm. it's a, or it's some sort of completion. When is the deliverable due? Yeah. What does that deliverable look like? What are the expected yeah. outputs? Yeah. And then let go of it. Yeah. Back and let people do their job. Well, you just use one of my favorite terms, outputs. I mean, you, we look at this, you know, talk about, and this is nothing you're not familiar with. So you take a look at it from a process map perspective. We've got our inputs mapped to goals and objectives, and we've got our outputs mapped to our checks and measures. Cool. What do you need to get the job done? Make sure it matches your goal. How do you know it's complete? When it's done, great. Did it get done on, on time? Yes. If it's not going to get done on time, try to give me a few days notice so that we can retool, make whatever adjustments right. we need. But that's where that's that's a recurring thing. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Don't abuse the system. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, so what letting, about folks that yeah. do work remote that have such a hard time drawing those lines? I know I mm -hmm. had this issue when I first started my business. I, I worked from a home office mm -hmm. and with three little kids, a little tough. Um, so what about folks that do work from home? Cause there's tons of benefits to it. For one, you just save a crap ton of money and gas. And especially now, <laughs> how, how do they keep it from just all washing together? Well, I tell people this, if it wasn't for the fact that I am a rampant organized project manager at heart, I would have never made this my business work. I knew going into it, I had to establish certain boundaries for myself, certain mm -hmm. expectations of how I'm going to show up right. in my business. Because as a self-employed individual, I need to do that. Now, what's very interesting is because we've taken the standard corporate structure and now shoved it into our personal life, <laughs> no one really gave us a playbook. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. So no one sat people down and said, okay. Uh, and there were a few blogs and articles, probably some YouTube videos that happened eventually, and maybe some people watched them, maybe they didn't. They talked about how to set up basically your own business. So as mm -hmm. everybody needs to be the entrepreneur of their career. Yeah. And when you come at it from that standpoint, that means you are self-authoring. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, you always were. Right. So now yeah. it's just more obvious. <laughs> And that's something I used to uh, teach and still, I guess, when we do uh, the safety consultations, especially, is you are effectively your own owner, owner operator, whether you're in the leadership position or you're on the well table or in the inspection bay, wherever it is, you are your own owner operator at that moment in time. It doesn't matter what anyone else does. You're responsible for you. And, you know, that's, now that concept can be taken way off in the left field and get kind of wonky. But at the end of the day, you're responsible for you. But uh, yeah, it definitely gets gets tough working at, at home. Um, you know, we've got uh, one team member and I told him, it's like, look, I'm going to pay for you to have an office because I just don't think it's going to work very well for you working at home. Whereas we've got another one and he said, you know what, Kyle, I set up a whole dedicated room in our house. We reorganized everything. So that that's my work. And when I go in there, work hat on. When I leave, work hat off. I'm like, cool. But there's so many different options so yes. how would a company regulate this because you really want it to be i mean there's a value in one size fits all and so companies mm -hmm. want to go that way because then it doesn't seem like i'm un treating one person fairly or another person unfairly so how could a company differentiate but still not not be perceived as playing favorites right right i don't think it's about playing favorites i think it's about understanding your people so one of the overlooked aspects of 
understanding how to get peak performance out of your team is if you ignore their work styles. So if you ignore their work styles, you're going to try to shove everybody into one size fits all mold. And quite frankly, that doesn't work. No. So, I mean, this is something simple as people who are more reserved or introverted versus more outgoing and people right. focused or extroverted. Those individuals are going to need very different workspaces. <laughs> people who are extroverted yep. need to be around people. Like, yes. I'm serious. This is not an option. Like, in order right. for them to have peak performance, they have to be around other people. Yeah. They'll go just as crazy, you know, as yeah. uh, someone else would sitting alone in a closet for a week. Totally unproductive. Which I would depressed. totally take be a great vacation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Daddy's yeah. on vacation. Leave him alone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's enjoying it. <laughs> no, no, no. But introverts, on the other hand, people are more reserved. They don't have any problem with the not being around people. So just at that fundamental level, then you have other aspects. I I like to lean on the disc side of work style assessments because it's simple, it's easy right. to implement, it's easy for people to understand, it's easy for people to leverage. And right. it truly does help people in team performance, not only understanding themselves, but understanding our face with others, yada, yada, yada. I could go sure. on, I won't. And it's really important to have a more adaptable environment than just everybody works this way. Well, right. That's yeah. just not, like I, like I mentioned before, Establish the inputs, establish the outputs, what the deliverables are, and let the rest be. Let the process let, work differently for each person. Provide right, and particularly for the, for the generations coming up now. They, they are not going to put up with other people telling them how to get from A to B, so from input to output. Yeah. Um, setting, establishing expectations and establishing boundaries is important. Yeah. However, you know, telling them, okay, well, you have to sit at a desk and you have to do, 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 do. Right. That's, that's the old way. That's the mm -hmm. old way of doing things. It's not going to be the future of work. Okay. The yeah. future works much more fluid. Um, the other thing that people really need moving forward into the future work and to increase retention is a safe environment to express themselves without fear of retribution. Or, or retaliation, rather. So dig into that a little bit deeper, because that can, again, as most things, you take the idea to its logical e extreme, and it's mm -hmm. totally wonky. So how do you allow someone, you know, t to do that without, I guess, disrupting what the, uh, the culture of the organization is? Right. Well, one great example is um, leaders absolutely must have one-on-one -on -one time with each of their team members that's scheduled. Mm-hmm. At a fundamental human level, it sets the expectation that, yes, I will have one-on-one -on -one time that is a safe environment for me mm -hmm. to discuss whatever I need to discuss with my immediate manager, yep. supervisor, whatever. Yep. Um, that's really important. And I won't be judged. It's no yep. stupid ideas. Um, so this person, the manager, really does need to be trained in how to create this sort of environment for their people. What um, are... Or, well, for folks that aren't accustomed to trying to do that, how would that manager structure that meeting? Like, I mean, just some some uh, tips, like how frequently should this occur? Mm -hmm. How long should these meetings be? Are there any, you know, minimum questions you'd ask on a weekly or whatever the basis is? I mean, we've got our own system here, but I'm kind of curious what uh, your recommendations are for it. Well, for one-on-ones, it's just, you know, not, not stand-up meetings where you're in a group, obviously. It's one -on -one oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, obviously, that would not necessarily be appropriate, although some people do it well. It just depends on the, the culture, fair? Yep. So the, this is more something that can be repeatable across a variety of industries without getting weird sure. uh, very quickly. So one of the things we want to do is have it at least monthly. Mm -hmm. Some For some organizations and some teams, that's two too often so mm -hmm. minimum quarterly yeah but i would encourage monthly because mm -hmm. there's a lot of things that come up in a month and a person needs that one-on-one -on -one time yep um so yes have an agenda have an agenda about how the flow will be okay so just as maybe it's as simple as okay you share it's open forum you share with me any top concerns issues coming up um this is not however a time for a status update yeah Nope. Not status update. No, gotcha. that's stand-up meetings. That's team meetings. This is not a, so how are you doing on that project? And this is also not a time <laughs> for your employee to rate your company. 
Yeah. Not time for that at all. Yeah. Well, we do something. It's a, a little different. I'm, I'm kind of curious your your take on this here as well. And this is just kind of what I've put together being the introvert that's had to learn the extroverted skills and being the, the closet geek that uh, doesn't like to talk to anyone that now that's my job. Um, so what I have come up with here is we have a weekly what we call set and match. Now, as we bring more folks on, probably gonna have to shift that to every other week or i'm just gonna spend too many hours a a a week just chit chatting with folks but what uh, we do is uh, i'll ask them on the federal survey on a weekly basis and we'll kind of review this and it's just useful for me to take a look at it gives me kind of a litmus test i guess of, mm -hmm. of how the folks are doing um so rate one to scale what's your stress level now your mm -hmm. stress level may be at home it may be at work i don't know but i'm just kind of curious on average how are you doing um what um how do you feel with your work uh, workload? One to five, you know, five, about my, my head's about to explode. I can't take it. I ideally want someone to be between, you know, maybe a three and a four. I'll ask what was the high point of your week? What's low point of your week? Half the time it's work stuff. Half the time it's not work stuff. It's kind of interesting to see. Um, and then I'll just, this is about as much as we go to on our, our, our status update, which is something I'll probably take a look at maybe in revising, is I'll say, what are your goals for completing this week? What was your goal last week? And I'll just go through last week's survey. Well, did you get all this finished last week? Did you plan to do it? What happened? What went wrong? What went good? Hey, what are you going to do this week? Cool. And then, you know, we're going to talk about it next week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's great for a stand-up meeting, for sure. Yeah. For one-on-ones, you go a little bit more in-depth, a little bit more personal. Okay. So maybe 45 minutes, even an hour. Um, okay. Depending on how many people you have reporting to, you don't want to make it too short. You don't want to make yeah. it less than 30 minutes. Yep. Um, and yes, does that take a lot of time? If you have 30 people reporting to you, absolutely it does. Get over it. You need to do it. Because <laughs> if you don't, well, let me give you an example of what happened. So I have a client, and she is the only female engineer out of many people. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a very competitive environment because the leader makes absolutely no time, zero time, zero one-on-one -on -one time for his team because he's very busy. Right. You're not sure doing what, but regardless, he's very busy. So he can't waste his time. All the more difficult with folks working remote, remotely because it's not like you're just going to have a little 30 second catch up while you're both right. getting a cup of coffee. Right. Yeah. So it has it's to be more fast. intentional in the first yeah. place. Yeah. Yeah. I got to rub elbows in the hallway. <laughs> so she gets stomped on because it's like this elbow, you know, mm -hmm. it's basically when the kids aren't getting attention around the dinner table, you know, hey, look at me, dad. Hey, look at me. Hey, look at me. That's what it's like. It's yeah. very, but it's the same mentality. You know, oh, well, I did this this week and I did this this week and I had to tell her what to do. And it was like, what? And she's yeah. totally incensed. Of course, she's more reserved. So she's yep. not comfortable speaking up. So we're really working on how to deal with this competitive environment or even if she should stay. Yeah. Right. But that's what happens. That's an example. Or worse yet, you just don't get something done because you're not quite sure what the priorities are. So, mm -hmm. you know, during a stand up meeting and in status meetings, these are when you should be expressing set priorities. But if it's something yep. personal, you really don't feel comfortable sharing, then, mm -hmm. you know, you at least have that time coming up in a week or so you can chat with the boss. Right. So, so that's a, it's a lot of value there. How would you encourage new managers, younger folks in these leadership positions to have those conversations without crossing, you know, this li imaginary line that we have mm -hmm. of work and home life. Again, the breaking this balance when we work in home life, how do they know this could get me in trouble with HR versus this is building a legitimate rapport and relationship with my people? really shouldn't have those kinds of questions <laughs> when we're doing a one-on-one -on -one meeting. But I mean, just in case they do come up, um, actually, I shared in a, a Forbes article it's a little while ago uh, why one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings are a waste of time. And I got a lot of people going, what? Because they are, because people don't right. use them correctly. Um, okay. They don't have an agenda, like I mentioned before. They don't, they don't have any emphasis on professional development, so personal growth of mm -hmm. the individual. Um, we're not talking about, hey, what goals do you want to achieve? They're also not providing support, so there's no feedback loop. But um, when it comes to anything that gets a little sticky, mm -hmm. if you're concerned about something that's getting a little sticky, definitely go to HR, definitely get some guidance there. Um, typically, these one-on-one -on -one meetings, that 
shouldn't necessarily come up, but hey. So give me an example then of of what that would be, because here's kind of what I'm looking at. So again, you know, we've we've got kind of a, you know, not a big team, but we've got kind of a mixture. So we've got, uh, you know, from teenage kids, adult kids, grandkids, and babies at home. And so there's all sorts of fun conversations that come up with how stressed out they are, how tired they are, how difficult this is, how difficult that is. So what are some maybe uh, standing topics that you would suggest to bring up during these one-on-ones? Well, like a, part of the agenda would probably be um, definitely the professional development part because okay. that's a big part. And the main, the, one of the main driving reasons behind the one-on-one is, is fueling that personal talent development, right? Helping that individual grow as a professional and mm-hmm. as a person. And also it's not just a, you know, a complaint session. That's what you don't want it to be. Yep. Um, that, that's not what that's not what it's there for. And on the on the flip side, there needs to be a space for people to share their concerns. So mm-hmm. typically the loose structure would look at, you know, any any when someone comes into a meeting with me, for example, my team, uh, when I was leading a team of a continuous improvement professionals, okay, is there anything that is a burning bush right now that you need to clear before we can have a, before we can be present for this meeting. Okay. So that would be number one, because in order for them to be present, if there's something up here they're noodling on and they just Mm -hmm. can't get past that, they're not going to, they're not going to be present and don't be productive. So that's number one. And then number two, okay. Is there anything that's come up for you? Like top wins, anything that's a concern. So wins and concerns, and then we would, you know, anything else, it's mm-hmm. not as structured as you really think it needs to be. Yep. <laughs> well, here's the reason. I know I'm kind of probably harping mm-hmm. on this maybe a little bit uh, uh, more than expected, but part of the reason I, I do is because between, you know, the status update meeting mm-hmm. to a one-on-one, mm-hmm. those lines can get very, very blurred for someone that's inexperienced. And again, we can go off on either tangent. The one-on-one can get too personal and I'm no more involved in your personal life than I as your manager ought to be, or B, um, this is just another chance for us to talk about all the stuff that got done last week and needs to get done this week. Yeah, neither one of those are okay. <laughs> okay, so kind of going back to uh, where we started and, and finished this out. So the workplace is changing dramatically. I agree. Mm-hmm. We are seeing a massive paradigm shift in the way that our workplaces operate and function. Um, there's never going to be getting back to normal. And new normal, whatever it may be, is probably going to have a variety of flavors and we're probably not going to see it for a while. Um, so what are some things that organizations can do immediately, you know, to start working on to build better retention and to make themselves more appealing for new talent that they're trying to bring in? Right. So just the ping pong tables and the pizza parties. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. <laughs> that was always my biggest beef, uh, even pre-pandemic. Uh, one of the things is ta- invest in your people, get to know who the heck they are, mm-hmm. what drives them, what are their values, and also have enough flexibility without being a doormat. Like you have enough flexibility for people to get their work done in a way that suits their work style Yep. And have it established that it's not a bias or it's not a favorites program. It's just yep. simply about how can we support you, how you work best to perform great work. Yeah. And then train your leaders, your emerging leaders, your middle managers, all the way up to the stratus, really. But give them the energy they need to learn how to be leaders of people, yep. not just processes and administration tasks. I- that, not enough. <laughs> nope. I, I think that is probably about the most ideal way to finish the conversation there is, and this is something I, I say so often as well when we're doing these, uh, uh, our QMS boot camp trainings is at the end of the day, you have to treat people like people. I right. mean, that's, that's really it. it. It sounds so simple. It's incredibly difficult to do, um, but you have to treat people like people. So where could folks go if they're looking to learn more to do it? They're like, great. I'm all on board. I need to make some improvement how can folks find out more to make improvement? Very simple. You can go to coach That's coach E first initial urban as an urban cowboy.com. 
and, and learn all about it. I've got some great resources there. I've got a blog. I, I'm also a member of Forbes Coaches Council. I've got my own podcast, Kurt Coffee Chat, which is a casual conversation. It's a catalyst change. Cool. So um, all kinds of great goodies to check out. Um, Fantastic. Well, we'll make sure that that is all in the show notes here. But uh, no, I, I really appreciate it. This is a uh, fun conversation. I think we probably went into a little more detail than uh, I expected we would. And we could probably be here for another two or three hours talking <laughs> about it. And oh, yeah, um, yeah. if we hadn't just uh, decided that the new output of the format was to be 45 minutes long, then I probably would try to dive in a little bit deeper. But uh, this has been great. I, I appreciate it. And definitely anyone listening that wants to learn more, fantastic, fantastic resource we've got here. Check it out. Um, you, you need to talk to uh, talk to Aaron. There's a lot, a lot you can learn here. And this really, truly is the number one thing that's going to change your workplace right now. So thank you very much. And I uh, appreciate it. Y'all have a great day.